Hey, faithful listener. Thanks for tuning in to the P40 Ministries daily podcast. This podcast is dedicated to helping you grow spiritually so you can grow personally. Let's grow together by building a consistent Bible reading routine. This is Jen, your host, and today we will be discussing the book of Mark. Good morning, friends and faithful listeners, and Merry Christmas. This is the last podcast episode we're going to do, at least the last normal one before Christmas. But sorry for the fake out. This is actually the end of season two, this episode, (laughs) (laughs) rather than yesterday's episode, which is what I said. But as you can hear, I have a guest on the podcast with us today, and this is Mark Cravens, and he's been on the podcast before. He was one of my very first guests I ever had on the podcast months and months ago, I think back in the summer. And uh, he's back joining us. And, you know, he has his own podcast. He is the podcast host of Hope Along the Journey, which I have recommended to you guys before and still recommend it. And uh, Mark, you know, thanks for coming back on the podcast. It's so great to have you back on. I'm really excited about this. So how have you been? I'm doing good. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate you having me back on the podcast. I, I really love and appreciate what you're doing. And, uh, it's, it was an honor last time. And I told you a few moments ago, it's an honor again to be here on the podcast and I'm doing well. And like you gearing up for the Christmas holidays. Nice. Yes. That's uh, exciting. I can't believe it's just, it, it, this year just flew past, didn't it? <laughs> oh, it did. It's I, and I, you know, I, I don't know why it feels that way, but it feels like somebody just put their foot to the gas pedal Mm -hmm. (laughs) after the summer was over. It was like the fall just zoomed right by. Yeah. So uh, but it's been a good year in spite of everything. So I hope so for you as well. Yes, for me as well. And I completely agree with you. For some reason, this year just really, really flew by. I remember I was in a staff meeting at my church last year, right around this time, and they were scheduling things out into the middle of July of this year. And I'm just like, wow, this is already going to be a very busy year. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. You say that last night, last night, I was sitting on a couch and my daughter, Jessica said to me, dad, what in the world are you doing? Your, your brows all furrowed and everything. I'm like, well, I'm putting the calendar together for 2022. And so we built a church calendar and then personal events. And it's like, Wow, I'm spending the year before it ever gets started, you know. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? It's it funny. Is. And the same thing for this year with my church. They're already way out into 2022. So <laughs> I get that. I understand it. So Yeah. Well, today we're going to be discussing Mark chapter 13, verses 12 through 23. Mark is going to help me with this uh, portion of scripture. One of the hardest things for me to talk about, I have learned on the podcast, is actually prophecy. So I'm really excited for Mark to um, come on here with me and to help me through this as I fumble my way through it. (laughs) (laughs) As maybe we both fumble our way through it, right? Uh, Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) But I'm going to be asking him some questions and hopefully we'll be able to uh, get to the heart of this matter. But like I said, I'll be reading uh, Mark chapter 13 verses 12 through 23 out of the W.E.B. version of the Bible this morning. Brother will deliver up brother to death, and the father his child. Children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. But when you see the abomination of desolation, from Daniel 9.17, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let the reader understand, Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let him who is on the housetop not go down nor enter in to take anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not return back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and those who nurse babies in those days. Pray that your flight won't be in the winter, for in those days there will be oppression, such as there has not been the like from the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will be. Unless the Lord had shortened the days, no flesh would have been saved, but for the sake of the chosen ones, whom he picked out, he shortened the days. 
Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Christ, or look there, don't believe it. For there will arise false Christs and false prophets, and will show signs and wonders, that they may lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. But you watch. Behold, I have told you all these things beforehand. So, Mark, this is kind of a uh, heavy portion of scripture, a little bit, right? And so, what? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. So, what stands out to you the most regarding this portion? Well, Jen, as as I as I look at this passage and have read it over multiple times, I, I think it becomes very apparent as you look at this passage and then the broader context in which you find this passage that the kingdom there is a kingdom conflict that is going on. The conflict that has existed since time began between good and evil, between truth and error, right and wrong, the kingdom of God and the, and the forces of Satan, Christ and the spirit of, of Antichrist, the Messiah and false messiahs that will come, going back even to the what happened in Genesis whenever there would be that, there would be that enmity between the seed of the woman and the serpent. Right. And so that seems to really stand out to me that that this passage is kind of in that context of the, the fact that there is there there are two sides and there is coming a time when when judgment is going to come to this world God is going to keep his hand upon his elect his chosen ones but there is there is a lot that we need to kind of be watchful of and keep our eyes open to so that we are not we're not deceived by what is going to happen as time moves on so yeah i agree with that and i believe that is what jesus is warning us about a little bit here and uh, that was actually my next question for you is what is jesus warning us about do you think in this entire passage yeah, I, I thought about that question because you had asked me earlier to consider that question. And I thought there are at least so three three things I think come out when I think about Jesus warning us. Number one, as I've already just touched upon, but is so important, is that the matter of deception. And again, while it's not within the passage we read today, within the passage itself, the greater context of this chapter is this danger of deception. I mean, at least four times Jesus says, like, watch out mm -hmm. or take heed that no one deceives you. Right. And, and then the final word in this chapter is the word, as we get to the end, is watch. Mm. As we get right to this verse we ended today is he says again, watch. It's kind of like bookends. Jesus begins the chapter by saying, make sure nobody leads you astray. And then as we come to the last verse today, he says again, just watch. So, right. And I think the danger of deception is, is something that has always been from the very first century of Christianity down to today has been this matter of being careful to not be led astray because many false Christs, many people who are going to claim to be Christ followers and to be Christ even are going to lead many astray. Second thing I think he's warning us mm. about is the inevitability of persecution. For he says in verse 13, you will be hated by everyone for my name's sake. So I think it's kind of like a heads mm -hmm. up. You need to, to realize this. You know, in other places, he says things like, you know, if if they hated me, they're, they're going to hate you. Uh, you know, it, in Timothy's Paul's writing to Timothy, he says to Timothy, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And so, again, Jesus is saying in this passage, because of this kingdom conflict that is going on, because of this titanic battle that's taking place here on earth between the forces of Satan and the kingdom of, of heaven, you're caught in the middle of this. And because we are children of God, then that makes us enemies of the forces of Satan and the force of evil. And so uh, we're going to be persecuted. I, I think, I think so we in America, we have, we've been exempt for so long 
and that I think we read passages like this and our eyes kind of glaze over. But for a large portion of Christian followers today, in fact, for the majority of Christ followers today, persecution is something real that mm-hmm. they deal with. Yes. I, I, Jen, I recently was looking at a survey that said that almost 70% of Christians live in countries where there is no religious freedom. And so that, that's what you think about that. That's, that's almost three-fourths of the Christians in the world today are living in countries where they don't even have religious freedom. Hmm. The third warning is real quickly is this. I think that, and again, this is quite, it's here in the passage, and that is that unparalleled tribulation is coming. So the danger of deception, he's warning us about that. He's warning us that it's inevitable that we're going to be persecuted. But also he's warning us that there is coming a time of tribulation, uh, the likes of which we have never seen and will never be repeated again. Right. <clears throat> and as you were talking about some of that stuff, that made me think, you know, I think, you know, Jesus was severely persecuted himself, but he never strayed from the truth. You know, obviously he, he was Jesus. Right. But like even in the garden, when he was crying and upset mm-hmm. and, you know, um, like sweating bullets, pretty much, he still continued on with what he had to do. And since Jesus is our greatest example, he I think he's saying almost to the, these his disciples here, you know, follow my example and right. continue to do mm-hmm. the stuff that you need to do, because even though this persecution might happen and will happen, you know, it, it's it's still important to continue on with the truth, because I think there's another verse in the Bible that says you can gain the whole world. But what good is that if you lose your soul? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And so that's. I would say I would say that's kind of a, another warning, or at least the premise of um, what, like summing up what you were saying a little bit is, even though persecution is right. going to happen, continue with the truth, because uh, it's more important that way. Well, and and like he says here, you're going to be hated by all men for my name's sake, but he who endures to the end will be saved. Mm-hmm. So there's that that admonition and that call that, in spite of what's going on. Just hang in there, be faithful, uh, persevere. And again, the, the Bible's just so full, Jen, of, of passages that call us to endurance and persecution in the face of persecution and to just stay in the race, keep on running, keep on serving, be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. And so this call to faithfulness permeates through this passage as well. Right. So what do you think verse 20 means? It says, unless the Lord had shortened the days, no flesh would have been saved. But for the sake of the chosen ones whom he picked out, he shortened the days. So I'd love for you to shine some light on that verse for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he's talking about old people like me, that <laughs> the days just seem shorter and moves along quicker. <laughs> well, that's a good, that's a great question. So and again, there's there's various opinions, so I'm, I'm going to try to give you the best the best that I can give around this verse. So number one, you have to go back, and so what's he talking about those days? So again, you go back to verse 19, and you see what he's talking about. He talks about, for in those days there will be oppression, such as there has not been the like from the beginning of the creation, which God created until now and never will be. So again, this unprecedented time of tribulation and coming. And so these are the days Mm -hmm. that he's talking about. So except we, those days be shortened. So I think what stands out to me is the fact that what God is saying here is for the sake of my elect, I am going to not allow this time to go as long as it could until total annihilation takes place. So I'm going to, the days will be shortened. The time period will be shortened. Now, again, what does that, what does that mean? Does that mean that, that God is going to, you know, in, in, when it all starts at some point, shorten it down? No, I think it means that God is going to predetermine before it ever happens that he is going to select a shortened time period than what could be that would 
uh, annihilate probably, if it kept on, annihilate nearly everyone. When I think about this, though, I, I jotted down some notes that I that for me that I want to remember as I think about this passage. Number one, it reminds me again that we are coming to this unprecedented time in in the future of tribulation. But secondly, God is sovereignly in control of this period of time that may seem out of control. Hmm. You know, God is controlling it. He's, this is all happening under his orchestration and his sovereignty. Thirdly, it reminds me that God's people are going to be present during this time. How much of the time theologians will grapple with, we talk about the seven year tribulation. Will we be here for half of it, a month of it, all seven years of it? Uh, I'm not going to wrangle with anybody, but it appears that they're going to be Christ followers during that time. Mm -hmm. And again, for their sakes, he is going to limit and shorten these days for the sake of those who are serving him. So that's Mm -hmm. the best interpretation that I can give as I look at it. It looks like it's a sign of God's mercy that in his mercy, he's going to shorten this time period. Yeah. I love what you said about God's sovereignty. I think that is the a great takeaway from that is that when things feel so out of control, I mean, like how they have been for the past couple of years, yes. you know, we have to remember that God is, in fact, control of everything. Absolutely. You know, he's in control of it all. Mm-hmm. Nothing surprises him. But the one thing I think that has always fascinated me since I've read it in the book of Daniel is mm-hmm. this abomination of desolation. And Daniel talks about it, and then it's mentioned here in the book of Mark. It's mentioned in Matthew, and I think in a a, a couple, maybe one or two other places in the Bible. But what do you think about this? What is this? uh, Actually, I I would love for you to give your opinion about what the abomination of desolation is. (laughs) (laughs) All right, here we go. Well, of course, when we talk about the word abomination, we're talking about a, a word that denotes an object of disgust. It's a strong word. It means repulsion, to abhor. In Scripture, it's used primarily to denote things associated with idolatry and gross immorality and ungodliness. Mm-hmm. This phrase, the abomination of desolation, could also be interpreted and maybe even better so, the abomination which makes desolate, or the abomination which lays waste. Mm. So clearly the prophet Daniel, which this is a reference to, speaks about on three different occasions, chapter 9 and chapter 11 and chapter 12. And almost every Bible scholar, Jen, will agree that probably the initial prophecy by Daniel refers to the time when Antiochus Epiphanes the Syrian king who ruled Palestine from 175 to 165 BC, uh, whenever he was over this segment of Palestine and did some uh, awful things to the Jews. He he slaughtered countless thousands of Jewish men. He sold their wives and children into slavery. He tried to completely obliterate uh, Jewish religion. In fact, we remember him for going into the temple and sacrificing a pig, which, again, was the most ceremonially unclean of all animals to the Jews. He offered a swine on the altar of God. He then set up an idol to Zeus, the pagan deity that he himself fancied that he was in the flesh. He was Zeus. Uh, And so this defilement, this abomination of desolation took place initially with Antiochus epiphanies. But as I, as I, when I teach prophecy, one of the things, Jen, that I try to, re, to remind people of is this, that prophecy often has both short-term and then longer-term interpretation. So what we may see in a smaller scale is a, is a preview of what is going to happen ultimately on a larger scale. Right. And so I think, I think it's a reference, no doubt. And again, most Bible scholars agree he's probably talking about the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, but Jesus is talking about something more. He's taking that prophecy to not just embrace that, but to also embrace what's going to happen in 70 AD, when Jerusalem is going to be just 
destroyed by the Romans. And then ultimately what's going to happen in the day of great tribulation when the antichrist is going to do something similar. And again, go to the book of revelation. You can read passages there that talk about what is going to take place. And again, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a telescope. You remember as you pull a telescope out, it's small and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you pull mm-hmm. it out. Oftentimes these prophecies are like that, Jen. They have more immediate fulfillment than maybe longer term fulfillment and then an ultimate fulfillment. Um, we see these with the prophecies of Messiah in the Old Testament. Some of them were fulfilled in his first advent, but many of them won't be fulfilled until his second coming. Yeah, and and I was actually thinking about that today because in my personal reading, I'm actually going through Jeremiah. And uh, much of what is said there is, you know, um, I think I'm in, I can't remember what chapter specifically, but, you know, God was talking about how he's going to gather his people together again. And that did happen, you know, back when uh, after um, Babylon, the people came back from Babylon. But it's going to happen again, you know, like he's, he's... Especially like in the, I mean, there's there's so much that talks about in the very end in Isaiah, like when mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Jerusalem's going to be a place where everybody comes to worship and just stuff like that as well. So yeah, that's a great point that I haven't really considered is that, yeah, I mean, there's a short-term prophecy and a long-term one as well. And, and I think everyone, every time I read prophecy, Jen, I try to think about that. I try to think about, okay there's immediate or maybe partial fulfillment that's going to take place and may has maybe has already take place taken place but then there's this ultimate that's going to happen and that's going to happen when it was going to happen at the end of time the great tribulation the millennial reign of jesus and that's when there's going to be this ultimate fulfillment of all prophecy Hmm. and second thing i remember is this and that that is prophecy never really, that this is the fascinating thing about prophecy. It never really makes sense until it happens. And then it's like an aha moment. It's like, well, oh, aha. Like Micah said, you know, oh, Bethlehem, you are the least among the clans. And yet from you is going to come one who will rule my people. Well, what in the world did that mean? 400, over 400 years go by, you know, it's kind of like, what is that little verse all about? Hmm. Well, then we got the wise men coming from the east saying, where is he who is born? We've seen his star. And they bring in the scribes and they say, oh, well, Micah, the prophet said 400 years ago. Guess what? Now it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that reminds me of uh, the disciples as well, when they just couldn't understand that Jesus was going to die and rise again until it happened. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> when yeah, the angel yeah, was think like, about it. <laughs> yeah. And the angel was like, he said it was going to, he was going to rise again. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, he told him, go back. Yeah. He told yep. him over and over, but they didn't get it. But then when it happened, then, it, then their eyes were open and they began to understand once they saw it fulfilled. Yes. And yeah. That's the way we all are. Yeah. And I agree with that. You know, I mean, I think we can speculate on this stuff, uh, all day and still we would not be anywhere close to what's actually going to happen probably <laughs> absolutely <laughs> especially yeah. in the book of revelation but but anyway so the last thing i want to ask you is you know this is typically considered like a kind of a heavy chapter and you know we're going into christmas which is like a uh it's supposed to be a time of like joy so is how can we find comfort in this chapter of mark 13 you know, coming up this Christmas? That's a great question. I guess that's kind of a, I guess it's a weird question, but I would love to hear your <laughs> your opinion on that. Well, Jen, let me do the best I can because I do think there's something here. So first of all, number mm-hmm. one, while this passage seems to portray what is coming or going to be a, a seemingly out of control situation, it reminds us again that even now with all that's going on in our world, all the heartache and sorrow and loss, the tornadoes that recently came through that devastated entire Mm -hmm. cities. That in the midst of it all, this reminds us God is sovereign. He is in control and nothing is happening without his hand upon it. And so Mm -hmm. I think, I think that helps us to understand 
the, the, new, the, the sovereignty of God, I think, brings comfort to us as Christians. Number two, uh, Jesus has promised us peace in the midst of our tribulation. I, I think of John 16, 33, where Jesus said, I've told you these things. And again, much like the passage we looked at is found in, John, in that chapter of John. But he said, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Mm-hmm. And that almost seems contradictory, but he says, I'm telling you this stuff so that in me, because that's the only place you're really going to find peace, that in me, you may right. have peace in this world. You will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And then lastly, I think when we see this take place, all of this begins to unfold. The Bible says in Luke that when we see this happening, that we need to stand straight and look up for our redemption, our salvation is very near. And so I think when we see these things unfolding, it reminds us that we're getting near to the end of this earth as we know it, and we're getting ready for the new heaven and the new earth, which the best is yet to come for all of us. And so I think in a way, as, as we think as this Advent season, as we celebrate his first coming, So it is, I think, that the passage today causes us to look forward to his second coming, the second advent when he will come again. Exactly. And a fun fact, I actually learned about the advent recently that when the um, holiday of advent actually started, it was not for Jesus's birth. It was for his second coming. And eventually, you know, like uh, Christians took it and used it for the time of Christmas. But the original holiday of Advent was celebrated to commemorate or to think about Jesus's second coming into the into the world. So I I found that really interesting. Yes, And we're in Advent season right now. This Mm -hmm. since Jesus went back to heaven, we're in we have lived in Advent season. We are Mm -hmm. waiting. Come thou long expected Jesus. Yes. And you know, the, the prayer of the early church was even so Lord Jesus come. And so I think that, you know, even when we read a passage like this, again, lift up your heads because it's an indicator that the ultimate fulfillment of our salvation is drawing near. And the longer I live, Jen, the more sorrow, grief and pain and loss and passing of loved ones and friends, the more I realize that This world isn't home. We're just strangers and foreigners passing through that our citizenship truly is in heaven. Mm -hmm. And this Christmas season, I pray that all of us will be reminded that just as Christ came as was promised, so he will come again as he is promised. Yes, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Mark, for coming on the podcast and sharing all of that. That was a a really great episode, I think. And um, hopefully you guys found something that you can uh, take away from that and uh, bring joy into this uh, Christmas season with your families. And, you know, I do want to wish everybody here a Merry Christmas. Don't forget that tomorrow night is going to be the P40 Ministries Christmas special at midnight. So definitely tune into that, and uh, you're going to hear me sing a song. <laughs> oh, should I stay up for that? <laughs> Is this going to be like a live event, Jen? No, I'm not going to do it live, but uh, I already have the song that I, I picked out, and I'm going to sing for you guys. Awesome. And um, yeah, But I'm very excited about it, and I hope you guys do tune in. But uh, yeah, so definitely uh, subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening from, and uh Um, Stay tuned for the episode tomorrow night for the P40 Ministries Christmas special. But friends, you know, also check out Mark Cravens. Like he has a podcast that's really great. It's called Hope Along the Journey. You know, he's had some really fascinating interviews on his podcast before that have really touched me. So uh, please go over to Hope Along the Journey and definitely check out Mark Cravens and his podcast and ministry as well. Now, of course, as I always do, I'll drop a link to Mark's uh, podcast in the bio of this podcast episode so you can just easily navigate over there. But friends and faithful listeners, happy listening and God bless. God bless.